welcome to A New Climate for Peace, How Europe Can Reconcile Energy and Climate Security. I'm Susie Dennison, the Director of ECFR's European Power Programme, and I'm thrilled to be just chairing this discussion this afternoon at such an opportune moment. Europeans have a tough winter ahead of us, um, with Russian attacks on Ukraine increasing in both intensity and in cruelty. And we're grappling with a new reality that we will be living in an age without peace within our borders for the foreseeable future. We have to deal with all the geopolitical consequences of that, including building up our, our sustainable security in this new environment. And currently, European governments are focused on the energy pillar of that, assuming that there will be no return to the international order that we knew this time last year. Um, building energy, sustainable and energy security in this environment obviously implies intense, deep um, uh, diplomacy to underpin the decarbonisation process um, as all global regions adapt to this new international reality. But we're going to explore today um, the different angles of how Europeans um, are dealing with that picture, looking at the foreign policy dimension of building up our security in this environment, um, firstly from the multilateral level, and then secondly in, in Europe's relationships uh, with, with one of the key regions that is going to matter in this new sustainable energy security picture, um, the Gulf. We've got a great lineup to have this conversation. Uh, we have my colleague um, Anthony Dworkin, senior fellow um, at TCFR, joining us from London. We have my colleague Max en Engstrom, um, our visiting fellow, joining us from Stockholm. And my colleague Cynthia Bianco, another visiting fellow at TCFR, joining us from Berlin. Welcome to all of you. You've all been working on different aspects of this picture this afternoon. And we're going to hear comments um, from each of you first before heading um, into a discussion on this, um, on this picture. So Anthony, if I could, I'm going to start with you. You and Max have published today um, a new paper, We'll Always Have Paris, How to Adapt multi um, Multilateral Climate Cooperation to New Realities. Can you maybe kick us off by talking us through what you see as the, the general trends in international cooperation and how they are playing out um, in the international arena um, relating to climate? Yes, absolutely. And thanks, Susie. Um, it's a pleasure to be on with uh, my great colleagues. Um, so this, in a way, for me, this paper is a continuation of work that I've done on different aspects of multilateralism over the last um, few years. And um, in a way, I think climate um, represents, you know, on the one side, the kind of ultimate global challenge, um, because it's a problem that all countries contribute to and all countries have a stake in um, finding a solution or at least uh, an effective program to try and limit it. Um, and yet, on the other hand, um, we are in a global environment now where cooperation is a lot harder than it used to be. Um, and we see a kind of uh, in, you know, maneuvering for power and advantage in the international system and ECFR in various ways has looked at um, across different fields at the ways that the kind of linkages that bind countries together are also being used as a forum for competition. And so the question here, I think, is how can we work together on climate uh, in a constructive way that doesn't deny the realities of international competition that's not sort of utopian. And in some of our previous work, we've put forward this idea of a twin track strategy. That is that we have a, a continued interest in working through these collective international processes of which the UNFCCC and the Paris Agreement are a kind of archetype in the climate realm. Almost all countries in the world are signed up to them. They represent that global effort. Uh, and yet for countries that are perhaps more like-minded or more ambitious to be able to move forward a bit more quickly and flexibly uh, alongside these collective processes. And of course, one of the things about the, the Paris Agreement is that it operates by consensus. So um, there can be a, a commitment to, to move forward with a, a work plan um, on mitigating um, the effects of climate change, and Matt might speak more, you know, more about some of these more technical aspects. But putting that kind of work program in place is only going to be done by consensus agreement. And so, um, what we're looking at is the way that, alongside that, um, the EU and other partners can move together more quickly 
Um, and there are a number of different avenues in which we already see this happening. Um, and one of the points that we're making in this paper is that these kinds of initiatives are, are helpful um, and valuable, but that they have to be uh, effectively situated within the wider collective framework. Um, and I think that is for a number of reasons. First of all, for legitimacy, um, there's a lot of discussion now about fairness and equity in the global fight against climate change. Um, this feeling that the countries of the rich world have benefited from developing in a carbon intensive way, um, and yet the impacts of this are already being felt disproportionately in the poorer world, um, which is now looking for its own development path and yet is having perhaps to try and find that in a way that uh, you know, is less carbon intensive. Um, so there is that legitimacy aspect. And also as a reference point, part of the Paris Agreement and the commitment to try and keep emissions, uh, to try and keep global warming down to 1.5 degrees centigrade um, above pre-industrial levels. You know, all of this is a, a kind of central reference point and it's agreed um, and it's the defined framework. And yet alongside that, we see advantages of, of moving forward more quickly, but these other paths not only should refer back to this, but they should also be open. They shouldn't be captured by political agendas. Um, they should be open to those countries that are willing to sign up to the specific kinds of commitments. Um, and so what the paper looks at is how this could play out in practice. And the other thing that we try and look at in the paper um, is um, how this more complex environment now um, pre certainly presents challenges to international cooperation, um, but it also in some ways presents perhaps new kinds of opportunities. And to explore that, we look a little bit at the drivers of climate policy in the different global powers. So the presumption of the Paris Agreement really is this mechanism that countries will act through peer pressure to sort of make increasingly ambitious pledges um, and then be pulled along behind those pledges. But in some cases, we see countries which, whose pledges are not that ambitious um, and yet whose um, work on reducing emissions is actually outstripping those pledges. And I think that's partly because there are other advantages and drivers, whether it's countries' own concerns about being seen to do something about issues that are affecting their population, or increasingly, I think, a sense that um, green technologies are the technologies of the future, that there can be a big advantage to being a first mover and to shifting and to trying to get an established position within the supply chains. Um, and those are bringing down prices. So, it's a, it's a complex picture of cooperation, but also competition, and those can perhaps also work together. So those are some of the issues that we tried to, to look at in the paper. Thank you very much um, for that excellent taster of the paper. And um, my colleague has, has, has put a link um, in the chat to um, um, if, you're, if you're tempted to read more, and it's also available on the ECFR site. Mats, could I maybe turn to you now? Um, obviously, COP27 is on everybody's minds. It's starting this weekend. Um, how do you see the trends that Anthony has been describing impacting there? And what role do you think that European diplomacy can most usefully play um, uh, in, in those meetings in Sharm el Sheikh? Well, thank you very much, uh, Susi. Yes, evidently, as you started also by, by saying, the energy situation is, uh, uh, is a kind of backdrop to Sharm el Sheikh and the relations between different countries in the global north, the global south, the competition with Russia and also with China in different ways. Uh, but we also have a debt crisis in developing countries that is worsening. And uh, we still have uh, the memory of the pandemic and the fight over vaccines and, and many other related issues that contribute to a perhaps deeper lack of trust between rich and, and developing countries than before and at the same time, rich countries have not fully delivered on their promises on climate finance, for example. So I think one should must see Sharm el Sheikh as, as a possible also conflict zone for some of these tensions that will be manifested there. So to some part, uh, this is also a way of 
still keeping the uh, Paris Agreement on track and, and moving forward. So what we do in this paper is then to look at COP27, but also to look perhaps three years ahead and, and to for some of the things also that we are proposing will not affect COP27 as if somebody would take them on. Uh, so, so it's more a question about then building this trust again. And the basic message is really then for the European Union to create true partnerships because partnerships are often mentioned and uh, of course there are also good partnerships between the EU and many countries in the global south in the run-up to Paris the high ambition coalition between uh, the Marshall Island of the vulnerable countries and the EU and others was really important for the success of the partnership agreement but to to get this trust again, we look at some areas and, and one of them is delivering on climate finance, of course, the promises that have been made, especially more grants to adaptation and uh, the issue about loss and damage where the German government together with the vulnerable countries have made a good proposal on the global shield, but where we think this was a coverage part of this problem and there is also a need for more hard money in the form of grants. And of course, this is a time of really difficulties for public finances in the EU, but we make the argument that this is also a geopolitical issue for the highest political level in the EU, because it's a way also of, of um, winning this, if you like, uh, battle of trust in, in developing countries and showing that the EU is a real partner that really wants the co-development of, of uh, many things uh, together with them. So, so that's one thing about climate finance. The second thing is about then sectorial progress and, and uh, we can perhaps talk more about later about energy that you have also written about yourself Susie for ECPR but we also address the issue of co-development and industrial development because we think this is really crucial and now there will certainly be some news about this just energy transition partnerships with South Africa, Indonesia and perhaps Vietnam before or at uh, the COP27 uh, but what these countries are also asking for, as well as Brazil, since many are now thinking about what Lula's victory will mean, is also the co-development of green industry. And, and this is something where we argue that this is a joint interest, that the, the voices in Europe that fear kind of competition uh, are wrong, that there are also very many benefits for the EU uh, in addition to gaining this trust. And then I won't be too long now, but then we also go into some other sectors like transport, agriculture. We discuss institutions where we think it's also important to link uh, ideas like the Open Climate Club, the breakthrough agenda in, from, from Glasgow, clear to the multilateral EU and uh, uh, institutions, not only the Climate Change Convention, but also UNEP, UNED, UNDP and others. And to say this clearly, to have this trust that everybody is included. And we also talk somewhat about the trade relations, not only about the carbon border adjustment, which is a conflict zone, but also about the increasing race in green subsidies. And that is, this is also something that has to be addressed in a way that gains the trust of countries that don't have the kind of money to put up for, for these kind of green subsidies. But I think I'll stop there at this introduction. So, so many points, some of them related to Shambhal Sheikh, like, uh, uh, finance and, and a good mitigation work program, but also a lot about building this trust over three years forward. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed, Matt. And I'm going to stick, if I may, with, with the point that you made about the need to create um, good partnerships, really substantial partnerships um, uh, around this agenda, and, and that is a role for the, for the European Union looking forward to, to rebuild the trust. Cynthia, you um, work a lot on Europe's relationship um, uh, with the Gulf um, and the Middle East uh, more broadly. And in your recent paper, A New Climate for Peace, from which we pinched the title for today's um, uh, discussion, thank you very much for that, you, um, you argued that the Gulf countries are on the one hand um, critical hydrocarbon um, producers, um, but on the other hand, um, very much exposed to the effects of climate change in terms of uh, water scarcity, uh, air pollution, rising temperatures, and so on and so forth. And um, but at the at the moment, there is not very much depth to the Europe's um, to, to the European relationship with these countries um, uh, uh, around uh, tackling these issues. 
Um, what what are you expecting um, from these um, players over over the coming months um, and years in this geopolitical environment that Anthony and Matt have, um, have have painted, and 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 how do you think Europe should engage with them on this agenda? Thank you very much, Susie. Yeah, like you said, I mean, um, the Gulf monarchies in particular are um, very, uh, you know, interesting actors in this specific time where we have a combination of an energy security crisis and a climate and environmental security crisis. And they are, um, I would argue, really pivotal on both, uh, in, in both crises because they are uh, among the, I mean, if you take if you if you take out Russia, basically they are uh, the most significant hydrocarbons producers, and combined the most significant producers um, actors in the fossil fuel industry in the world. And at the same time, they are, as you were saying, absolutely um, at the forefront of the climate crisis. And every year, more and more, um, you know, severe severe challenges. Um, with specifically water scarcity, uh, but also obviously air pollution and extreme temperatures, which in turn cause float, floats and sandstorms, for example. And sandstorms, you know, uh, they, ha they have been um, sort of scientifically proven to be responsible for every sandstorm responsible for literally hundreds of people having to be rushed to the hospital, for example, in Iraq. Uh, in 2021, um, and uh, literally, you know, millions of dollars of damage to critical infrastructures, the civilian uh, uh, infrastructures, um, and uh, the economy in general, and th this massive disruption to, you know, closed airports, um, you know, anything you can think of. When, it, when there's an extreme sandstorm, everything stops and everything is at risk. And so, being these very complex actors, um, they are uh, have become really protagonists amid this uh, really severe crisis that we're living after the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And we as Europeans, before the Russian invasion of Ukraine, we basically had very, very uh, irrelevant energy relations with the Gulf monarchies. And basically, our entire relationship to them was, uh, you know, between the two poles, really heavily weighting uh, down the side of the climate security rather than the energy security uh, pole. Obviously, after the Russian invasion of Ukraine and with the necessity to diversify our supply of energy, um, we have started uh, engaging in very high level, very important, crucial conversations with our counterparts in the Gulf monarchies in particular. And so you have really an unprecedented number. If you look at the numbers, you know, and put it into a historical context, it's an unprecedented intensity of high level visits between heads of state and government from the European um, member states and heads of uh, uh, EU institutions so to the Gulf monarchies and vice versa. We are facing you know, some willingness to cooperate, but basically two major obstacles that, in my opinion, um, is really urgent to address and trying to sort of uh, overcome. The first one is uh, the Gulf monarchy's reaction is we, you're coming, you Europeans are coming over because you need us now, but uh, it's incredibly short term. So you come here and you want to sign contracts only for five years because you have your climate objectives. And then what happens after five years to us? And um, all of the investments that is required to um, really step up our, our production of, in particular, fossil fuels um, is cannot really, we can't have a return in five years. So it's uh, the kind of timeline, the kind of short termism, if you want is incredibly dangerous and it is met with the full closure on the other side. So there is no possibility for short termism. Um, well, you know, in my ECFR work and be really following these questions uh, and all of the bilateral negotiations in this, in this domain for months, I've come uh, to a, a, the conclusion that one possibility that could really work is to uh, really get our heads together as Europeans and propose comprehensive long-term energy partnerships to the Gulf monarchies. But the trick here is 
we have to inscribe the energy transition within those partnerships, within those contracts. We have to be really creative. And I know very well from engaging with the energy firms that this is not being done before. So it's, it is very disruptive and energy firms and their legal teams are you know, very, very sensitive around these things. But anyways, it is possible because contracts are written by, you know, they, they can be readjusted to the times. And so I think that a very credible opportunity is to inscribe that energy transition into a single contract that starts off with a more conventional partnership on fossil fuels, but then also sort of signals our long term commitments to the GCC monarchies, provided that they, uh, with our in, uh, support and incentives, use and reinvest the surplus that they're making into that transition. And so the contract then you know, opens up to the opportunity of going directly into other things like low carbon ammonia, for example, or you know, uh, sort of uh, has a very clear uh, commitment to uh, numbers uh, and very specific um, increases in carbon capture and how our European technology can, can support uh, that decarbonization and that transition. So in other ways, I really think one of the, our major, major problems with the GCC monarchies in particular as Europeans is to signal long-term commitment without completely betraying our own necessary um, uh, goals for climate security and climate change. And one way is to be creative with, with contracts. And the second and final point I want to make, which is uh, even more closely directed to the paper that we are discussing today, A New Climate for Peace, is the other major obstacle that we are facing is obviously we uh, as Europeans come across uh, from, a, from a Gulf point of view, from an external point of view, from the point of view of states who are not leaving our energy security crisis as hypocritical because we have been talking to them about phasing out investments into the fossil fuel industries, um, phasing out uh, production, decreasing the, the volumes of their fossil fuel production. And now we're asking them exactly the opposite. We're asking them actively, we're asking the Saudis to pump more oil because it is absolutely necessary and basically the only way or one of the very few ways in which we can lower um, the, the, our energy bill uh, costs, right, across Europe, yeah. which is becoming a, a serious political problem. So this second accusation of hypocrisy, um, I, I tried to address that in the paper by coming out with, you know, three, a number of, of very operational uh, measures and ideas and projects and initiatives that the Europeans can put in place uh, ahead and during Sharm el Sheikh, and even more so, already looking at the COP23, uh, which will happen in Abu Dhabi in the United Arab Emirates. And these very operational initiatives with, are basically a way that can show for real our commitment um, as global actors for climate in three different, different areas. First of all, as uh, diplomatic uh, actors as conveners of a number of diplomatic initiatives that are already sort of ongoing in the region, but really need encouragement and endorsement. The second one is fostering the scientific cooperation. And here the European Union is absolutely a gr global champion uh, for that. And we have you know, a number of programs that can easily be extended or adapted. And then finally, really uh, thinking of ways, um, because the Gulf monarchies are not uh, poor or developing countries, technically speaking, they don't need our investment or aid in particular. Uh, the third area is to think uh, in terms of very strategic investment. So sort of uh, um, focus on areas uh, uh, such as, you know, new generation desalination uh, techniques. Desalination is a central process in the production of green hydrogen, which is one of the most uh, you know, interesting energies, clean energy sources for our own future uh, energy future in Europe. But desalination is still a very unsustainable and has a number of, of problems and, uh, and issues 
uh, on, in terms of the impact on environmental security. There is a lot that we can do and there are still already some commercial pilot projects that could be built upon. And thank you very much, Susan. No, thank you, Cynthia. That um, fascinating and, and, and some um, really sort of concrete thoughts uh, on, on how to overcome the challenge as well. Um, so I just want to flag to everybody that um, the floor is now open. If you want to put questions into the Q&A box, um, we will pick those up and um, I will um, channel them to, um, to our speakers this afternoon. But while you're, uh, but while you're thinking um, through those questions, I just wanted to, to follow up on, on this final point, um, which Cynthia raised um, around hypocrisy and um, Europe's sort of internal focus on our own energy security um, at the moment being sort of flagged up by other actors. This is not only um, peculiar to the Gulf, we've heard this from African leaders as well, um, that um, our, our, our sort of climate leadership, our leadership by example, turned out only to be paper thin um, when uh, our own in, 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 uh, security was threatened. I'd be interested in, in, in your thoughts, Anthony and Matt, um, from the work that you've been doing on you know, the extent to which um, climate leadership is still something that Europeans can or should aspire to in the current geopolitical environment, and whether or not um, the increasing momentum around some of the like-minded um, uh, initiatives, the climate clubs um, and so on, risks exacerbating the kinds of divides um, that, um, that you've all been highlighting in different ways, um, or whether you think that, that that can sort of still be helpful um, in this environment. I don't know which of you would like to um, take that first. Well, I, I can say something very quickly and then I'll mm -hmm. hand over to Matt. I mean, I think this is a, a really important point. And um, in a way, the obviously it's a very particular moment, but I think, you know, really as Jinshia was saying, it's vitally important to keep the, the longer term perspective in view. And it may be that in terms of these kind of short term measures, particularly on gas, that the EU thinks they can be combined from a European perspective with still staying on track um, to, to meet the European goals on emission reduction um, over the medium term. But they obviously, exactly as Jitia was saying, that they do involve these kinds of investments um, and in, in other countries, which are then left with facilities that um, risk becoming um, you know, difficult to use. And um, I think this, there's a kind of wider point here about how um, Europe combines its own very ambitious internal um, agenda with its kind of external agenda on um, the green transition. And I think this is true with the United States as well. So I do think that Europe still has a role uh, as climate leaders. Um, they obviously were very centrally involved in formulating um, and working on the, the kinds of frameworks that we use. Um, and in a way, if you look at what the United States is doing, the US um, program um, that set out in the Inflation Reduction Act that President Biden um, managed to get through is very much geared on US domestic industries. So there's a lot there about subsidies um, and not that much um, in terms of kind of raising the costs for Americans of, um, of using fossil fuels. It's really designed to shift them over. And this is already causing some problems uh, with Europe, let alone with the rest of the world. Um, and it's not really matched so far by the kind of significant uh, funding for overseas transitions that, um, you know, that we would like to see. Um, and on the European side, I think some of the, the problems are slightly different. And here, um, it's really the point um, that Matt's touched on before, that um, how do you balance this idea of kind of having Europe with a very ambitious carbon pricing um, market mechanism with Europe as an open trading partner with the rest of the world? And there's a lot of controversy, obviously, around the proposal for some sort of carbon border adjustment mechanism. And I think a lot of suspicion around the idea that um, Matt's mentioned about um, some sort of climate club. And I think it's, you know, maybe Matt's can expand on this, but I think it's really vitally important that if some sort of club 
um, bringing together the, the EU and the US in some way, if they can get over their different approaches, um, that it shouldn't be seen as the kind of rich world, you know, just simply in, um, looking after itself and erecting defenses to stop um, more carbon, you know, carbon leakage going out, but that it's really combined with a pro program of outside investment that's designed to bring the rest of the world along with the transition, that it's not kind of ring fencing the, the fast movers, but it's, you know, open, that it's much more open um, and linking back to these kinds of partnerships um, that, that Matt's mentioned. So well, perhaps you'd like to pick up on that. Thank you. Yes, Matt, did you want to come in on this point? Yes, just to follow up a little on, on that. Uh, so, I mean, if we talk about the European Union, and I agree, uh, still a climate leader, one important point is to agree on the Fit for 55 internal package, the almost the crucial parts of it. Uh, the Czechs want to do it in December or very soon uh, next year under the Swedish presidency. That will be something that others will be watching, of course. Then uh, there will certainly be this discussion about hypocrisy, perhaps also from African leaders uh, when the Shaman Sheikh starts. But uh, of course, uh, uh, that is a sensitive point. Uh, and I think it's really crucial there that in these deals with whatever country it might be, Senegal, others, that there is a component, a really strong component regarding other development aspects uh, uh, in those uh, bilateral agreements. And this is also something that will be very interesting and important when the EU now does joint gas procurement, that uh, this is also linked to a stronger cooperation with the countries uh, uh, bu buying gas from. This is, by the way, also relevant for the discussion about critical minerals that uh, relations are based on true partnerships and support to industrial development in, in those uh, countries. Uh, uh, and, and I think uh, this is also something with, where the Endike Global Euro program for be a bit technical within the EU, the big development assistance program, if you like may, has to be adopted to this new reality. So it more also promotes these issues about renewables, energy efficiency, local industrial development, in addition to these gas uh, relationships. And then on the coalitions of the willing, that is a large part of this paper, we discuss that relation with the UN processes. So it's um, the uh, Climate Club idea. Uh, and as Anthony mentioned, uh, there is uh, skepticism around that in, in some quarters uh, in other parts of the world. And, uh, and uh, we argue for this strong, then, and as I mentioned, investment in trusts in, in other ways. And, and, uh, and that is something that really has to be there. It will be really interesting to see what the relationship will be now with the new uh, uh, Brazilian leadership uh, on this, in addition to the other big major uh, emerging economies outside of China and, and India. Uh, but uh, that's uh, about the the um, uh, climate club, but just finally also to say, if we talk about this relation, that there is, if we look at the positive side of things, really much progress on the breakthrough agenda from Glasgow, this mm -hmm. thing about going to net zero emission vehicles, phasing out coal, and many other things there, green hydrogen. So, so that is something where they also, um, in the uh, Breakthrough Agenda report, recommend several actions to promote this inclusiveness with the global south and i think that is something that can be carried forward very soon thank you thank you very much indeed Matt. um uh Tinsia, i want to come back to you now there have been a couple of specific um questions for you in in the chat box one of which um specifically relates to this um this question um this conversation that we've been having around around partnerships um uh, a query about the fact that whether or not the fact that the eu's climate targets um do imply um, uh, an up to 52% reduction in gas demand um, um, up to 2030, whether or not that is perceived and talked about um, in the Gulf states um, as part of this um, uh, picture that you've been painting for us on, on the sort of the, the dangers of short termism um, in the relationship. And then a second question sort of asking if you could expand um, a little bit further on um, exactly how it would work um, to inscribe the energy transition into the long term um, contracts and, and how, how you would build that um, uh, clean component uh, in, into that if you've given that any thought. Yeah, so thank you very much. Um, 
Yeah, so definitely the, and the two questions are, I think, connected and linked to one another because, yes, absolutely, the Gulf monarchies discuss um, the EU um, climate targets and um, the, you know, the, our, um, our own uh, goals in terms of re uh, reducing consumption of fossil fuels. They discuss that um, obsessively. <laughs> they discuss that every time, every single time, that a European tries to bring up uh, the topic of energy in any way, shape or form, um, pledging for their cooperation in particular. So they are very aware of that and that's what scares them off the most. Uh, at the same time, these are goals that are, I mean, if they are, as of now, I would argue, um, inscribed into our political DNA and the aspirations for, you know, of, of all generations, in particular the younger one. And we have now, you know, we've, we're over that debate. We cannot reopen that debate. Um, these are too important for our future. So that's why uh, one, you know, a long-term partnership that has a transition inscribed that basically is for example, a commercial, you know, first of all, usually energy agreements are, um, I mean, a, a, an energy firm lawyer joked with me that um, they, uh, between, uh, between firms, they sign agreements that they already know are going to go into arbitration basically the next day, right? It's energy firms and firms in general, they make agreements based on sort of loose declaration of intents, and they just have to agree on the political scale of and framework. And once you agree that you're going to have, um, you know, an investment into uh, a fossil fuel partnership first, but then, you know, you're committed to still remain engaged in conversations with a different energy source because already you are building, for example, hydrogen ready infrastructures, which is the case in most of the infrastructures that we are building as European Union uh, in the new uh, generation, then, you know, you have a practical sign and signal that uh, you can transition that partnership into a different form of, of gas. Basically, again, energy firms, uh, executives would tell you that once you have an infrastructure that can take the molecule, you can play around with the molecule in a way. And again, we are still we still have to make advances te technically because of you know efficiency uh, concerns uh, uh, in particular when you look at uh, hydrogen ready gas infrastructures but this is already technically possible so imagine what could be possible if we continue and, and actually double down on our investment and our focus and you can easily uh, you know, rights, uh, especially if it's a state-to-state -state agreement, or or even better, a European Union to Gulf monarchy agreement. You can work on a framework that basically um, commits the parties to continue investing uh, and doubling down on on these sort of uh, of projects. And this is very interesting, also for the Gulf monarchies, by the way, because. It's not like the European Union wants to uh, downsize dramatically the uh, sort of receiving gas and, and, and oil and the rest of the world uh, is going to uh, necessarily continue importing fossil fuels uh, to, to, to um, the same or even greater volumes. So this is a global transition. Uh, energy transition that is involving other actors beyond the Europeans. So, so it is actually very interesting from a commercial point of view for the Gulf monarchies to have such a large market that is willing to be basically a test um, customer for clean energy and be uh, the seed funder even in some cases, if you look at infrastructures, and basically help them uh, make those uh, already uh, existing projects commercially viable. Um, so there's a mutual interest there. Uh, and the final, final thing I wanna say about that is that our, uh, as Europeans, we don't, we're not really using politically, for example, the fact that Russia is selling underpriced oil to China and Asia, which is the, are the most important markets for the Gulf monarchies. Um, and so they are 
basically becoming very quickly a, a significant competitor eating up market shares for the Gulf monarchies. And that, you know, we basically are, are energy dynamics are shifting up, uh, be, uh, in, under our eyes and we're not using that to encourage uh, the Gulf monarchies to cooperate more with us on energy. Thank you very much. And that's an excellent segue because I was just about to say we've been going for 40 minutes and we haven't touched in a significant way yet on China. And we have a couple of um, uh, questions in the box that lead us to do that. Um, I was wondering if um, perhaps Matt um, or maybe Anthony, you wanted to comment on a, a question that we have on what do you see as the main leverage um, or tools that the US and the EU has in getting China to do more um, on climate um, and, and, and managing the climate tensions with China over CBAM, critical minerals and so on, but also as, um, as Cynthia has pointed out um, uh, in terms of uh, the energy uh, transition and, 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 and consumption um, in, in the current environment. And um, linked to that, we have another question on the extent to which you see potential from the work you've been doing for the weaponization of climate um, cooperation um, uh, as, um, uh, as, as a factor with, um, with geopolitical rivals um, such as um, China. Do you think that um, this element of, of competition could be damaging for multilateral cooperation? I don't know, Max, do you want to go first this time? Uh, sure, I think Anthony has also written on, on this, but uh, thank you very much for, for the question, I think. Uh, by Ford wrote the first question is an eminent China expert him, himself. Uh, I recommend others to, to read him. But yes, th this is of course a difficult issue the relation to, to China. And I, I don't think one should uh, say that there are any clear solutions to this. There is an element of competition linked to the more also broader geopolitical uh, conflict between US and China and to some extent between the EU and, and China. Still, it depends, I would say, on what area we are discussing. I mentioned this breakthrough agenda and the breakthrough agenda report. China is participating there. And, and you have, um, if you look at zero emission vehicles, for example, the European market is still a strong uh, lever for European influence, what the rules are here, and that they don't diverge that there is a global kind of way towards uh, standardizations of some aspects. And, and I think that is something where China has an interest to, to cooperate. And it is also, uh, I mean, the EU taxonomy has been discussed, uh, criticized for inclus including gas, but it still uh, is a strong factor in getting rid of coal. I would say, if you look at sustainable finance, there is already the EU-China uh, cooperation on taxonomies and sustainable finance. I think that is another level the EU has, that has come rather far on sustainable finance. And we can also then coming to the second question, I think you have to analyze these potential weaponization case by case, and you can't really delink that from other aspects of, of security, but uh, I'm, I'm sure there are issues where China and the EU have an interest, joint interest of stability in areas where this can be a, a way also of moving forward on, on, on stabilizing regions. And, but uh, that is a very short question to a complicated uh, <laughs> question. Uh, it's answer to a complicated Absolutely. question. Yeah, thanks. Well, thank you for trying. Um, um, and um, yeah, may maybe Anthony, um, do you want to sort of pick up on this point about weaponization and link to that? We have a specific question on the, the fact that up until now, and Matt has alluded to this, um, climate um, as a file was to some extent um, insulated from other geopolitical power plays. Um, but do you see a danger that that is changing um, in as a result of, of Russia's war in Ukraine? Absolutely, and I think um, you know it clearly is changing, and it's changing. You know, in clearly in the case of the US and China, who are still the kind of most important players in the global climate scene, as we know, um, the China has suspended its um, negotiations or its um, you know bilateral discussions with the United States on climate. Um, as a result of uh, Speaker of the House's visit to Taiwan. Um, so that's a, a pretty clear signal that the, um, you know, that the Chinese no longer see um, cooperation, despite the best hopes of, um, particularly of John Kerry on the American side, um, that the climate could be kind of fenced off, um, that the, you know, that's not going to work anymore. And I think 
um, the moves that we've seen since then from the United States on um, you know, taking further steps in technology decoupling and um, semiconductors is only going to make this more complicated. And I think um, you know, we're going to see the kind of supply chains around green technology um, becoming an area where states are increasingly seeing it through a security lens. Um, and therefore there will be, a, you know, if not an element of weaponization, at least an element of kind of defense against potential weaponization. Um, and so probably some degree of, you know, decoupling in that area as well. Um, but it's, um, you know, as Matt's was saying, I think there still are a lot of areas where um, it clearly makes sense for countries to cooperate um, or at least to coordinate what they're doing. And the more that this can be done in a kind of political, in a, rather in a, in a technical rather than a political framework, I think it may still continue. I think what's going to be harder is the sort of political um, negotiations. And it's, I think the, the period where um, the US or Europe might hope that um, China could be encouraged to take further steps beyond what it was planning to do as a result of kind of Western pressure or encouragement um, where, you know, it's over. And if anything, the, the kind of, you know, perception that countries are taking steps as a result of global pressure um, could be counterproductive, I think, rather than productive. Um, but I think there's still a lot of room for for more technical level cooperation. And if you speak to European officials about the climate club, I think you know some of them will express a hope that China might eventually be part of such a club as well. Mm. So it's going to be in this area as in others, a rather complex mix of um, competition, increasingly strong competition, but some degree of necessary coordination as well. Mm. Maybe staying on this kind of um, point about the technical level cooperation, we had an interesting uh, question about whether or not there is any conversation about developing ethical codes um, uh, around uh, cooperation or at least sort of de-risking um, the idea that, that climate is something to be weaponized. Is, is that something that any of you have come across in, in, in your work? It's, it's not something that um, I've seen particularly, but I guess it does speak to your point, Anthony, about sort of depoliticizing um, the, the conversation. Yeah. yeah, no, I haven't come across anything, but I think the the question of the kind of broader relationship between global finance and funding and multilateral organizations and investment in emerging markets and the developing world is another area where cooperation, you know, along with linked questions of global debt and so on, um, where some degree of cooperation or coordination is still would still be really valuable. Thank you very much. OK, um, let's come back to um, the sustainable energy security um, uh, dimension um, of the conversation. We had um, a, a question from um, uh, from Lisa Fisher earlier on in the conversation um, that I wanted to explore, um, sort of basically asking about um, uh, whether or not um, we're doing enough to um, integrate the management of energy supply and demand. Um, uh, and um, and ensure that we're not only focusing um, on supply, but also incentivizing um, uh, uh, more efficient delivery um, of services. So um, did, did either, I don't know if Matt, um, you or, or Cynthia wanted to comment on, on, on that question from this work, you know, um, she's asking how governments should set up capabilities and frameworks to deliver this energy security that differ from a supply focused approach. I think that's a really good and uh, relevant uh, question. And uh, I mean, it was I also think also posed in relation to the gas deals, but I think it can also be argued in relation to to uh, renewable projects that are very important, but still, how can we do more on energy services and energy efficiency? And uh, this is something uh, if you look at the EU first, that I think should play a more important role in the programming and the actions in this. Uh, development cooperation the EU has, the NDK Global Euro Programme, and, and that requires, in my view, that there is a, a knowledge in the EU delegations who are in these countries and they're working very better also together with member states, embassies, uh, how you do this in each specific uh, country in the way that the EU support really contributes to, to uh, energy efficiency and to 
uh, energy services in the sense that this question was about. And by the way, also to material efficiency and, and not only green production, although that is important. So, so that is one part, I think, of the answer that since there, there is a more strong, if I say so, uh, individual companies pushing on the production side, there are many more dispersed actors on the efficiency side, and then the EU needs to use more of its convening power and, and, and be more active on promoting these kind of projects in relation to other countries. That's one answer. The other one is, uh, I mentioned this breakthrough agenda report already, there are good proposals there, for example, on moving forward multilaterally on energy efficiency, for example, on some kind of agreement or minimum standards for energy efficiency in, in products such as air conditioners and others. So I think that is an underexplored area also of multilateral cooperation. Thank you. Thank you. Tinsia, did you want to come in on this? Uh, yeah, I asked, actually, I wanted to address um, another comment uh, by Please. Lydia on, uh, on uh, hydrogen ready infrastructure. And, you know, disclaimer, obviously, I mean, it's true that we're still, uh, um, we still need some time um, and there are major problems of efficiency into the uh, transformation and retransformation of the, um, of the, the, uh, the, the hydrogen. Um, however, we're not as far um, and that we're not that far that as we might think, you know, there's already been two different uh, shipments, test shipments of low carbon blue ammonia to from the UAE to Germany and in particular through the port of Hamburg to uh, an industrial uh, major copper producer called Aurubis in, here in Germany. Um, and this is exactly, and this, you know, this shipment was immediately then used into the industrial production. And this is exactly the kind of actor that is struggling the most in Germany, given the energy crisis that we're living through. Um, this is the kind of uh, heavy industry that has a hard to abate uh, product, pr production process. So there is a lot of potential. We're still in a test phase. That's definitely true. But um, you know, it's it's possible. It's possible, and it is uh, really one of the very few ways that we can make. A, you know, they, they, there is the old saying: "Never waste a good crisis." This is one of the few ways that we could not waste this energy crisis by trying to focus all of our attention and resources into being creative, into believing into the you know scientific and technological progress um, that we collectively, I would say, do achieve when we are, particularly when we are uh, under real stress and then when, when we're forced to, and the signals are there. Uh, so we have, I think, to be um, really pushed through, pushed through and, and look to the future and trying to be daring, um, even with uh, uh, these you know, technologies and these issues that really seem um, futuristic in a way. Another issue that, another dossier that we've uh, focused on is, for example, uh, slightly different argument, but trying to move past lithium as, as a way to power batteries. And there are a number of startups in Europe um, that are gathering funds and investments from all around the world that are thinking of alternatives to lithium as a, and imagine what we could do is we, if, if we didn't need uh, lithium for all of our renewable energy technologies and you know we have this is the time to to really push through with ambition and ideas I think well you've been talking you've um you've actually um inspired another question that I think I need to direct back to you um but just to signal that we're going into our last rounds between the three of you so you've all got um a minute each um to, to leave us with your last thoughts but Cynthia, yeah, um, maybe we'll, we'll, we'll sort of reverse the order and, and, and start with you. Um, and, and perhaps as part of that, you could answer this question on whether it seems right to assume that um, the GCC will continue to um, uh, concentrate on the lower value um, section of value chains around um, uh, developing clean energy potential um, or whether you expect that to shift. I mean, that's a very easy one. I can make it in less than a minute because uh, they, their ambition is to move beyond that. But I think we're still really a few years behind. So it's an excellent question because that's the direction that they're pointing to, but it's really a long way ahead. So not, not a major thing in the, in the, in the short term. 
Okay, thank you. Um, and then um, uh, turning then to, to you, Matt and Anthony, for your last thoughts. Um, using uh, Cynthia's time frame of, um, uh, of sort of uh, over the next uh, the next year or so, um, what what do you all sort of um, if we were to have this conversation uh, again in a year's time, what um, I, 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 what are you sort of assuming um, will have shifted in um, uh, in in European thinking um, around this um, energy and climate diplomacy agenda? Um, uh, uh, you know, wh wh where do you see the sort of the trajectories going in a positive direction and in a negative direction over perhaps the next year um, time frame? Um, Anthony, do you want to go first? Okay, I mean, I guess for me, um, you know, as I think we've both emphasised, um, this is a kind of critical moment, I think, in terms of showing that the will is there to really direct significant amounts of funding to... Um, you know, to emerging markets, to the developing world. Um, I think it's a moment where the, um, you know, clearly it's the next few years, as everyone has said, and all these reports have indicated is going to be crucial. Um, and it is looking more clearly advantageous for countries to make the transition. So I think there is a case to be made, um, but it requires big upfront financing um, that these countries have a lot of trouble raising on their own. And so I think the really critical area is going to be thinking about ways that Europe can provide finance, mobilize finance. Um, it's going to be a difficult discussion because as you said at the beginning, Susie, this is a, a moment where all our, our own societies are feeling pretty much under pressure. But I think that will be a crucial thing to look at in the coming period. Thank you very much. And then Matt, um, last word to you. Um, what are the kind of the final thoughts um, that, that you want to leave us with um, from this discussion? Well, there was another good question about uh, the risk that the Russia-Ukraine uh, attack on Ukraine could, could derail the climate negotiations. And I, I think one advantage so far has been that the climate convention is a rather formalized process that moves forward and forward. But in this situation, also with Putin wanting to talk about the European uh, past colonialism and other things, it's really important to concentrate on these true partnerships for the EU to, to show in practice with finance and as we said, but also with this co-development of technologies with an openness on trade and other issues that these are true partnerships. And then, as we said, that to look, for example, at climate finance also as a your political tool for, for the highest level in that context and, and uh, not only for the climate ministers, although they are important, of course. Thank you very much indeed um, to all three of you for um, your reflections and engaging so actively with them um, with, with all the questions this afternoon. And, and thank you very much to all the participants for a really challenging set of questions. I noticed now that there are one or two that um, that we didn't have time for. So we'll have to organize another discussion um, in the coming months to pick up on uh, nuclear as a geopolitical tool and some of the other global players that we haven't managed to touch on. Um, but that's, I'm afraid, all we've got time for today. So I wish you all um, a very good evening. And for those of you um, who are heading off um, to Egypt, a very good COP. Um, and um, as we mentioned on the chat here today, both of the reports um, that we have been talking about can be found um, on the ECFR sites um, uh, under uh, either our climate uh, homepage or um, uh, I think still um, the general homepage at the moment. Thank you very much. Have a good evening.